Bienvenidos, Ushamdi, and welcome CTS 231, Section 841 students, for the second eight-week term of the fall 2017 semester at Anne Arundel Community College. This is the Networking 4, or the Cisco Networking Academy Connecting Networks V6 course, and this afternoon's video tutorial and solution set is going to be on the in-class Netacad lab 3.6.1.3. And the reason that we're going to go through this lab and talk about a number of the things that we saw in this lab is that for the majority of the material, this is all new material. And so there was some serious heavy lifting that was required here. And I want to make sure that we talk about these topics individually uh, and in the context of this lab. So we're going to be talking about BGP, specifically eBGP. We're going to be talking about GRE or the generic routing encapsulation. And we're going to be talking about PPPOE. So they really threw a lot at us in this single lab. So definitely a difficult lab without a doubt. Now, uh, I'm actually going to show you the um, image here. So this is the actual lab that we're working on. I have this drawn up by hand. Uh, but this is the image that uh, sort of details what we've got. Now, I have this laid out in my lab, and I've got 2911 routers in my lab. And so our serial interfaces are serial interfaces. The gig interfaces go into fast Ethernet ports on switches. And we'll also talk about the fact uh, that really the only reason, especially here on Router 3, uh, this gig zero zero connection and over here on router one that really the only reason that those connections are there so gig zero zero on router one into the switch and then gig zero one on router three into the switch is so that we can configure the gigabit ethernet interfaces on the routers so that they'll be up and I know that sounds kind of strange right but that's really the only reason that those are configured, that 192.168.3.1 that's configured here, it's solely plugged in, because again, this switch is connected to nothing, right? And there's nothing else here on this switch. It's so that we can have that interface up. So what could have been done to sort of ease the, the manual running of the cables as part of this activity was for the gig zero zero connection, and the gig zero one connection on routers one and three respectively, those could have been loopback addresses. And you can see gig zero zero is just simply a 192.168.1. Now this orange connection here, right? We need to talk about this and let me actually change the color of the pen here or the pencil. So you can see the connection comes into switch one and then it comes over to switch two and then comes up into the ISP router. So that is where we're going to be doing BGP over PPPoE. And one of the interesting things that you definitely want to take note of here is take a look. There is no configuration for an IP address on either the provider side or the client side on the physical interface. And let me clear it. Let me qualify that. So on the physical interface, we've got Ethernet connectivity, and we have this connection between the switches. And again, there is no configuration that we did on the switches, with the exception of that port right there. We put it into, I think, VLAN 111, right, to segregate it from these connections here, right? The, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the link between uh, switch one and switch two, as well as uh, the gig connection, gig 01 and gig 00 from router one and router two. Now, this is where we're gonna form this PPPoE relationship with the ISP. So a lot of learners are asking, well, I don't understand what, what is PPPoE. I know PPP, which works over serial links, but PPPoE, when would you do this? Well, PPPoE uh, is actually pretty popular, right? So uh, if you're doing ISDN, uh, typically you'll be doing PPPoE. Um, back in the day, uh, if you had a dial-up connection, like a, like a DSL uh, connection where you're trying to bridge, like the your router connection was an Ethernet connection, but then, you know, the DSL side is ATM, so we had to bridge that somehow. And so typically what was done was PPPoE, right? And for, you know, broadband connections, uh, 
In some instances, you'll see PPPoE because, again, um, if you go back to the dial-up days where PPP and PPPoE got their start uh, and were pretty uh, popular, you know, you had a provider, right? So I'll just put, you know, the provider here with the P and homes were connecting in. And how is the provider going to authenticate you, right? So how do we authenticate over Ethernet? Well, you would use PPPoE. And it was kind of the same way with, you know, providers selling ISDN and DSL is you would configure PPPoE, you'd have your username and your password, and that is when you called in, uh, that is how you would authenticate, right? And so that's kind of how, you know, the DSL, ISDN, uh, the, the broadband connections can leverage PPPoE, and that's why providers like it. And there's other, you know, you can get billing information and things like that. So Again, you know, it's one of the new topics, and, and this activity is really all new topics uh, for the CCNA level. So let's go ahead and dive in here. Uh, I'm going to shrink that down. And so the routers, right, uh, don't pay attention to the numbers that you see up here. Those are my internal numbers as I keep track of my stuff. Uh, but we are, you know, branch one, router three. We are customer one, router one, and ISP router two. Now, I've done the configuration for the IP addressing uh, on the on all of the routers, and they gave us the configuration to cut and paste, but let's walk through it because it's worth walking through the ISP configuration because, again, hopefully this is going to provide some clarity around how we were setting this up. So remember that it is the ISP. It's the customer here. Let's get into privilege exec and into global config. It's the customer that requires the service from the provider. And so on the provider side, this is where we're going to set up the virtual template, right? And this is where we're also going to be setting up uh, the PPPoE group that we're going to be using. So let's go ahead and, and knock that out. So first things first, uh, let's do our BBA group, right? Broadband Access Group. That's what that BBA stands for. And if you look on the Cisco website, uh, if you're looking at broadband access, you can find a lot of documentation on PPP OE. So if I was to say BBA dash group and put a question, you can see the only broadband group that we can create, right, is of type PPP OE. Now, I'm showing you these two options here because in the activity, uh, it showed global, right? So they said BBA dash group PPP OE global. Now, global is not something that like we create it. That's the default, right? It's kind of like the fallback name because I could put any name in here. I could put ISP1, right? And then that would be the PPPOE BBA group number. But again, the default, right? Or I shouldn't say the default, but the fallback is just simply global. So I would say BBA group PPPOE global. Now, you can see what happened here. So as soon as I type that command in, we get line protocol on interface virtual access one, right? Virtual access one. So now we've got this virtual interface, which we're gonna be leveraging, right? Uh, and we're gonna be creating a virtual template interface. So first we want to reference the virtual template that we're going to be using. And you can see we can create up to 200 here inside this BBA group. So let's just stick with what the lab was showing us. We're going to say virtual template one, and we're going to create an interface for this virtual template because this would allow the provider to do what? Exactly. I could segment the configuration on this router up right, for, for PPPoE. So I could create a BBA group, uh, you know, for customer one, and then another group for customer two. In fact, once we do this, let me finish this up here, the basic config that we were using, and then we can go ahead and add in some different groups as well. So, but first things first, so we've got our BBA group defined, we've got the virtual template, which is gonna ultimately be the interface that we're gonna create which is where the address pool is going to be defined. Because again, 
when a customer dials in, the provider, you know, we need to give them, an, as, as the provider, we need to give them an internet address. And so this is how this gets done automatically behind the scenes with PPPoE. So we've got that in there. Virtual template is going to be one, right? And so now let's go ahead and configure the interface virtual template. And actually, let me get out of the BBA group. So interface, and let me do not capital, not cap sensitive, but we'll put it in here. So again, you can see this is where we go into uh, the virtual template interface that we identified under the, the BBA group PPPoE uh, global command. So we're going to say virtual template one, right? Because that was what we identified here. So that's the interface that we're now going to configure. And this is, again, it's kind of segmented off, and this is where we'll do our PPP authentication as well. Now, a couple quick notes, and this is not in the lab. You'll notice that I'm going to say PPP authentication, whoops, let's spell it out there, authentication chap call-in, right? So I'm configuring the service provider's virtual template interface that's going to be facing the customer with PPPoE, and we're setting this up so that it's doing the authentication with CHAP, and it's going to wait for a call-in to come in. And that's how it would work. The customer is going to, you know, when the interface comes up, that's the, you know, the quote-unquote, the call-in. You know, there is no modem, right, because we're talking about doing this over Ethernet. So there's not a modem involved. But one thing is interesting here, so let me uh, stretch that out, PPP CHAP, and I should have call-in. Yeah, there it is. Okay, sorry call it. So we've got this command here. Now, let me ask you this. Under a normal serial interface, would I be able to come into the interface and issue PPP commands? So let's take a look at that. So let me go to, I know router one's got a serial interface, and in fact, it's got four of them. So let's go into global config, and I'm going to say interface serial 000 colon zero, and let me do a do show run interface. Let me make sure before I start saying that we're going to run some commands and they're not going to work. Okay, no in cap PPP. So I'm going to pull that off. So here's what the interface looks like right now. We've just got an IP address on here. So if I came in here and said PPP authenticate, now see I'm hitting tab, right? So I'm going to say PPP question mark, and it says unrecognized command. And so this is important. So remember, with the virtual template interface, right? And where am I at here? I'm on router 14. With the virtual template interface, the default encapsulation on a virtual template interface is PPP. Now, that is not the same for the dialer interface. And again, remember, on the client side, we are creating a dialer interface. And that is how it is, you know, quote unquote, calling in and it's going to dial in and that's why we've got this language that we're using like ppp authentication chap call in right and dialer and virtual template and so that's why we're talking about it in the context of it's like a dial up type uh, activity that's going to be taking place so i'm going to be able to say ppp chap or ppp authentication chap call in and i hit enter you'll notice it works because if i said do show interface uh, virtual template one, right? Take a look at encapsulation, right? PPP. And that's what it is by default. The dialer interface is not going to default to PPP. It's going to default to HDLC. So we've got to keep our eyes peeled for that. So again, here we are. Do show run interface virtual template one. All right, so we don't have any IP address. We've got PPP authentication chap call-in. So we know we're going to be using PPP authentication chap. Well, if that's the case, we know that we're going to have to have a locally defined username, at least in our use case, right? So, but before we do that, let's go ahead and put an IP address here on the virtual. And this was all in the activity. 200.30, and this was a slash 27, 255, 224. All right, so 209, 165, 200.30. Now, remember, we're doing PPPoE. So there's a little overhead involved with PPPoE. In fact, it's eight bytes. 
So what we want to make sure that we do is we want to make sure that we set the IP MTU. And actually, I'm sorry, let me do MTU. We want to set the MTU size, not the IP MTU, but the interface MTU size to 1492, right? To account for those eight additional bytes of PPPoE encapsulation. So we say MTU 1492. So now what does our interface look like? Do show run interface virtual template. And this is kind of a hassle having to type out virtual template, right? But you get the idea. So here is my virtual template interface. I've got my MTU set. I've got the IP address set. We've got the chap call in set. Now there's one additional setting that you'll notice in the lab. And I'm going to come back to this. We're going to create the pool first, right? And it's basically, think of it as like a DHCP pool. And it's really what it is. It's our IP address pool that instead of doing DHCP, right, we're going to refer to it as an IP local pool that we reference with PPPoE, okay? So let me pop out of here and let's create our, you know, quote unquote DHCP pool, but it's not really DHCP, right? Think of it as it's a PPPoE pool of addresses that we're going to be giving out to um, clients who are dialing in with their or calling in with their dialer interfaces. So IP local pool, and we'll call it PPP. We'll stick with the PPPoE pool. And here is just like when we do 209.165.200.1, you know, it's just like when we do the DHCP pool here. So you say IP local pool, and you could actually use DHCP for this, but we're going to stick with the plan here, 209.165.200.20. So there is my pool. Now let's go back into the virtual ah, interface, virtual template one. Let's go back in the interface virtual template and let's add in the peer default IP address and name our pool, or the name of the pool, PPPoE pool, and we'll get this added in. And now on the interface, do show run interface virtual virtual dash template one. There is the configuration. Right, and so that is the entire configuration for that virtual template interface. So let's review real quickly, what have we done? So let's say do show run, pipe it to section BBA group. So we created a BBA group, and in this BBA, in, in this BBA group for PPPoE, uh, we basically named it global, which is the default name, and we created a virtual template one reference right, indicating that it's going to be using, that virtual template one will be using PPPoE. So we've got that taken care of. Then we created the virtual template interface, right? So do show run interface virtual, virtual template one. And so there's the interface on the ISP or the provider side, right, that's going to be waiting for someone to call in, right? A dialer interface to dial and call in. We're going to authenticate that individual with CHAP. We've got an IP address pool that we created. And let's say do show run include uh, PPPoE pool. We should PPPO. Oh, I'm sorry. It's got to be caps. Sorry about that. There we go. And so we see we've got this PPPoE pool out of which we're going to be assigning IPs to the clients who are dialing in. And this is our IP address right here. Okay. Now you'll notice something else, right? This is a 224. It's a slash 27. And we're way up here at dot 30. And we're assigning out addresses that aren't in the same range as our address. And so remember that PPPoE just like PPP is going to install a peer neighbor route. And this is a route that gets installed on both sides so that there's reachability even if you're not in the same subnet. And so why is this why would that happen? Well, think about it. The provider, right? They're going to use a slash 27 right here, right? A dot 224. So slash 27 only 30 usable IPs in this range. But let's say they've got thousands of customers that are dialing in that are going to need a 
public IP address? Well, we just simply do a pool of all those addresses, hand those addresses out, and then PPPOE, just like PPE, uh, PPP, will go ahead and put a peer neighbor route in the routing table for us. And so we'll see that uh, in a bit here. So, but keep that in mind that that's how it's going to maintain, even though they're on different, you know, clearly different subnets here, right? So there were 30 usable, or I shouldn't say different subnets, but clearly different set of IP addresses, but I could be handing out, you know, IPs that have nothing to do with this subnet. All right, so uh, we've got that taken care of. Let's create our user, right? Remember, we have to be able to authenticate. So username, and it's going to be customer1 and the password. And remember, it can't be secret. It's got to be Cisco PPPOE, Cisco PPPOE. Remember, it's got to be uh, plain text, right? We have to enter it in. We can't put an MD5 hash in here. Just like PPP, it would not work. Okay, so we've got the BBA group defined on the ISP. We've got the virtual template interface defined on the ISP along with the pool and the user. So now if we were to go to the drawing here, right? So here is that gig zero zero interface that ultimately we're going to be doing this PPPOE communication over, right? Now remember, there's no IP address on the physical interface here, and we don't have an IP address on the physical interface here for the customer. And so let's go ahead and stand up this PPPOE session. So let me transition back here. Let's get back to the... So on the interface, gig zero zero, on the provider side, we're going to say IP, TCP, adjust maximum segment size. And the segment size, right, we're doing this, and let's talk about these numbers here. So this IP, TCP, adjust, MSS, is 1452. Why is it 1452? And what is maximum segment size? So remember, we've got some header information, right, at the TCP, uh, the TCP IP levels, right? We are layers. We've got 20 bytes uh, at um, of header information at the IP layer and 20 at the at layer four, right? At the TCP, we'll say the TCP IP. All right, let me make sure I get this straight. So at layer three, there's 20 bytes of header information. At layer four, there's 20 bytes of header information. So that's 40 bytes. If I was to add 40 to that number right there, right, what would I get? Yeah, exactly. I'd end up with 1492, which should look very familiar to you, right? And so that's why we're throttling the maximum segment size down to make sure that everything fits through the interface, right? Through this virtual template interface. We have to shrink this down, right, to make sure that we accommodate for that additional overhead. Okay. Uh, and then under this interface, there's only one thing left for us to do. It's to say PPPOE enable group. Whoops, and this is our group name. What did we name the group? We named it global. And that's it. So on the provider side right now, we have everything configured that needs to be configured for PPPOE. So at this point, and I'm making sure I'm following along with the lab here, and I don't want to skip ahead. So they show the configuration for the BGP on the provider network. So let me add that in here real quick. So because again, I think this is for, and this is for 209. Let me make sure we're not missing something here. 209.165.1. The neighbor is 200.1. Yeah, so that is going to be over the PPPoE connection. So we're going to hold on. The, we'll actually hold on that. So let's set it up on the client side now. And here's where some confusion came in on the client side. And David uh, and Sonal had asked some questions about this. And let's get into privilege exec and into global config. So part two of the lab, it says configure a PPPoE client connection. Well. All of the commands that would be required on the client side can be found 
uh, in figure 312, and it walks through creating the dialer interface, right? And it shows us the commands. And here was the confusion, is that on the lab, all of the steps it wanted you to create or to, to execute, it put them in bold, in bold type. And typically that bold type indicates, oh, that's a command I'm supposed to be running. But that's not the case here. These are simply instructions that, excuse me, that you need to follow. These are not the commands. And that's why when it said PPP, CHAP call-in authentication, that's not the command. Remember, the command is PPP authentication chap call in. And so when you see PPP chap call in authentication, we thought, oh, it's a typo in the lab, but it's not. It's simply telling you this is what I need you to configure on the client side so that this will work. So let's do that. Uh, let's make sure. So we'll, and we'll do it in order here. So it says configure an interface dialer one. So interface dialer one, right? So I've just created a virtual dialer interface. Now it says a negotiated IP address. Well, obviously a negotiated IP address is not a command, but we do know that you can say IP address negotiated under this configuration. Uh, and now it says set the MTU to 1492, because again, we've got that eight bytes, right, of PPPoE overhead. And here is why it tells you to say PPP, well, it says PPP encapsulation, but we know the right command is what? Yeah, it's encap PPP or encapsulation PPP. So again, what's in the lab are the instructions, not the commands. And again, that's why it caused some confusion. And even when I looked at the command you first showed me, I was like, oh, yeah, that's backwards. So we thought that there was a typo. So let me, before I say encap PPP, let's say do show interface. Dialer 1, let's confirm what the encapsulation at layer 2 is right now by default. And there it is. So it's HDLC is the encapsulation by default. So on the virtual template interface, the default end cap is PPP. On the dialer interface on the client side, it's HDLC. So we have to say end cap PPP, right? Then it says we have to pick out the dialer pool. So we'll say, oops, sorry, dialer pool one. And now we have to do the call-in authentication. And this is where it said, it showed you PPP chap call-in authentication, but we know that's not the command, right? So it was by saying this, it's telling you, hey, set up PPP chap call-in authentication. So let's say control U, and we're gonna say PPP authentication chap and this is where I would say, call in, right? Now, the provider's expecting a username and a password when we dial in, right? Or when we call into the provider. So we're going to say PPP, chap, hostname, and we used customer one. And then PPP, chap, password, Cisco PPPOE. And again, I liked how the lab in parentheses there says unencrypted, right? Because we can't hash it. So that's the dialer interface. So the dialer interface is all set up. So let's look at our dialer interface. Do show run interface dialer one. And there it is, right? So very, very straightforward for the dialer interface. Now, what do we need to do? So we've got a virtual template interface on the provider side. We've got a virtual dialer interface on the customer side, but physically, Right, Physically, they're connected over those Ethernet ports. And this is why we went into gig 00 and put configuration on that port with the uh, TCP adjust MSS. And that's also why we, um, or, yeah, the maximum segment size was 1452. And that's also why we said enable global PPPoE because we're saying that we want to use PPP as the encapsulation method of the Ethernet traffic that's going to be flowing back and forth between the client and the provider. So we get into the 
interface gig. I don't, I, uh, yeah, is it gig zero zero? Gig zero one. Sorry. Interface gigabit Ethernet zero one. Let's make sure to show run interface gigabit zero one. And so again, no IP, totally shut down. So here we go. This is how we're going to do it. We're going to say, well, actually, we'll configure it, then we'll say no shut. So it says enable global PPPoE. So we know that that's PPPoE enable, right? And you could put the gloop. Now, watch what happens. If I just say PPPoE enable, take a look. We get a virtual access interface. Now, do show run interface gigabit ethernet 01. Do you see what happened? So I said PPPoE enable and hit enter. Proving what's the default group. Exactly. So if we didn't put anything in, which we didn't, it's going to use group global. Now, on the provider side, if they had used a different group name other than global, like customer one, then I would want this to match up with that, right? We'd want to keep that in sync. So we're going to say uh, PPPoE, PPPoE enable, and then same thing with the uh, IP TCP adjust MSS to 1452, because we have to accommodate, right? We've got to downshift the size uh, of our packets, just a tad. And uh, the reason I'm pausing is I'm making sure I'm not skipping anything here in the uh, instructions. And then finally, we do the last thing, right, which is PPPoE client, right? And it says, what it said was, set the PPPoE client to dialer pool one. And here's where we put in the dial pool number and one, because that's what we've got set up. Right, we use dialer one. Oops, sorry. So we want to make sure that that right dial pool number is going to match. And where did it go? Dial pool number up here, right? For in, in case you had to troubleshoot or something like that. And so now let's go ahead and say no shut. So we're going to bring that interface up, and you can see that it says interface went down. But now take a look. Change state to up. Right, gig 01, change state to up. Now, I don't believe I've got port fast on these ports. So let's say do show IP interface brief here. And we're looking to see, did we get an IP address? And we have not yet, but I'm assuming it's because spanning tree. Oh, you know what? I don't know if this interface is up on do show IP interface brief. Let me check the server side because these were all shut down. And unfortunately, take a look at that. That is going to be a problem. So uh, I think we are in, and let me look at the interface again real quick here. Gig 00, zero on the provider side. So interface gigabit ethernet 00, zero on the provider side. We're going to say no shut. So do show run interface gig 00. zero. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Definitely want to make, <coughs> make sure... We have the uh, provider side up, definitely important. And let's do a do show IP interface brief. We're probably going to have to wait about 45 seconds here, I think, for Spanning Tree to do its thing. And I apologize. And I actually have the switch that these guys are plugged into is actually unplugged uh, from its console port right now. So do show IP interface brief. So gig zero zero is up, up. And let's take a look over here and see. Ah, fantastic. Take a look at that, right? That's what I was waiting for. Spanning tree did its thing. So we've got dialer bind, right? Interface, and we get another virtual interface bound to profile, profile dialer one. And it changed the state to up. So let's do a do show IP interface brief and take a look. There it is. So when I said it's not DHCP, that it's PPPoE, right? Because remember, PPPoE is pretty much PPP, but it's used on Ethernet. So it's the IP control protocol with PPPoE that does the address negotiation and bingo, we end up with an address, and this is exactly how it, it was done in the day and is done today when customers are dialing in with DSL, ISDN, and they're using PPPoE, 
this is it. This is how you get your address, right? And then this gives me the connectivity. Now, do show IP, um, what do I want to say? Route. So I want to check here to see, did we end up with, yeah, so take a look. You see how it says that the, the 209.165 200.30 slash 32, that's the, it's a host route, right? It's a slash 32. And so we're not seeing the slash 27 that's configured uh, on the interface. We're seeing a peer host route because that gives me connectivity. Even if it wasn't in the same subnet, I would have connectivity to it through my dialer interface. So that way the provider, again, the provider could have any IP address they want, and then they're giving out all these, you know, randomly globally routable IP addresses, but I can still get to the provider because I've got this peer route that gets installed here, right, through that dialer interface. So we've got our PPPoE set up, and we are ready to rock at this point, but let's do this. I'm I'm going to flip the page here, and okay, we got an IP address, and everything looked good there. Now, they wanted us, the next thing to do is GRE, so let's take care of that. So, remember that image that we saw uh, here. Let me pull this back up. We're going to be doing, actually, we just look at it here. So, we're going to be doing a GRE tunnel, right? So, the PPPoE is working. Right, so we've got this PPPoE set up right here. So I've got communication from router one up to router two through PPPoE. So what I'm going to do now though, is I'm gonna set up a BGP, I'm sorry, a GRE tunnel between router one and router three, and I'm going to run an eBGP peering. Because remember, eBGP by default We've got a TTL of one. It has to be directly connected. But what kind of an interface is a GRE interface? Exactly. It is a virtual point-to-point -point interface. So router one and router three are going to think that they've got this directly connected point-to-point -point interface. And it's over that connection that we're going to run eBGP. All right, so the PPPoE piece is done. We've got that sorted out. Now let's go ahead and configure a GRE tunnel. So very straightforward requirements. And using the destination interfaces, let me make sure I'm reading this right. So customer one, branch one, we're going to create interface tunnel zero. And we talked about why you might want to use uh, a higher number than zero. Right, because maybe multicast is going to be used at some point. Uh, you want to make sure you avoid it because then multicast fires up tunnel zero by default. So we'll instead of tunnel zero, let's use tunnel one hundred. Right, kind of get in the uh, the best practice, good habit there. So from router one's perspective, and I don't want to clear that. Whoops. So from router one's perspective, from the customer, can I get to? And I'm assuming, and I'm looking at the diagram here in front of me that they're going to want us to use that serial interface. Yeah, because we've got a default route. So let's do this. So you can see we've got the static default route. Okay, so I'm tracking now as to why they're, they had us do this. So this was part of the cut and paste config. We have a default static route that goes out the serial interface. And that serial interface is right here. Okay, and then the same thing was done here. I should say, actually, it was done over here on router three, I believe. Let me reference the config real quick. So yeah, we had a default route on one. We had a default route on three. And the default route on the provider is actually to the loopback one address, which is the internet here. So this is the default. Kind of sim the loopback is simulating the internet. It's kind of faking the internet out, which, again, we could have done the same thing here as well as here, right? But they had us connected into the switch, and I'm assuming that they had us do that because we had to connect this through, this had to go through the switches, right? Had to go through the switches. 
uh, because we're doing PPPOE. Well, I shouldn't say had to. We probably could have directly connect. Well, I don't know. It doesn't make much sense to do that. So yeah, we want to use the switches. Let's just say that. So again, our default here is to the internet. So let me come back over here and let's ping the serial interface on router three, right? Which is the one that connects into the ISP. So from router, let's say do ping, and router three serial interface is 209.165.200.86, right? That's the outside publicly routable outstanding, right? So I've got communications there. So for the first time, we'll come to the branch, right? And let's try the same thing. And we, we know it's gonna work, but let's confirm to that serial interface 209.165. And this is pinging the, we're pinging through the ISP over to the customer. So 209.165.200.81. All right, fantastic. This is a recipe for success right here with our GRE tunnel. So let's get her, get her done. So what are the requirements? So the IP address, right, we're gonna be using a slash 24 on the tunnel interface. And the tunnel mode's gonna be GRE over IP, which we know is the default. And the tunnel source and destination using the serial interfaces. So super, excuse me, super, super straightforward, right? So let's get into interface tunnel 100. All right, I'll use 100. Uh, and let's just knock it out here. So router one, the customer side, we're gonna say IP address. This is my tunnel interface IP. This is what the routers are gonna think is directly connected. 192.168.2.1, and this is gonna be a slash 24. Uh, and again, we're using a slash 24, but there's no reason why it couldn't be a slash 30, right? Maybe a little more appropriate. Uh, the tunnel mode, I'll type it in anyway, but this is the default tunnel mode, GRE IP. And it would have been that had I not typed it in. And then very straightforward, right? My tunnel source is serial 000 colon. And on my, my serial cards are a little different than the ones we have in class. So I have to put that colon zero, but just kind of, you know, go with it. It's serial 000. And the tunnel destination, right? I can't put an interface. I've got to put the IP address, right? Where am I going to go? And that's the IP on router three, which is 209.165.200.86. Okay, and then I hit enter. Now, I'm only using GRE, and we're under this tunnel interface here, right? There's no IPsec, right? We're not securing anything. This is going across the internet, and there it is right here. This is what I'm looking for, keep alive. So, not a bad idea if you're only doing GRE, right? Because GRE, we talked about IPv4 access lists, right? And how they are stateless. They don't keep track of any of the state information. They don't keep track of the conversations and the flow. And GRE, ironically, doesn't keep track of the state information on the other side of the GRE tunnel, right? So let's put some keep alives on here and this kind of helps us avoid in the keep alive period the default is 10 seconds let's say 30 and keep alive retry so we'll say after 90 seconds if we don't get anything and we're going to do the exact same thing on the other side that we want to go ahead and take the tunnel interface down because we don't want traffic to black hole to think that the interface is up when in fact it's not right so we'll set some keep alive now when you're doing ipsec uh, IPsec is going to be taking care of a lot of, especially when you're using Ike v2, right? And they've got this thing called dead peer detection and things like that. So you're going to have traffic that's going to be flowing, right? But we're going to go ahead and do this because we're only doing GRE right now. So what does my tunnel interface look like? So let's say do show run interface tunnel 100. And there it is, right? We've got our keep alives and think of it just like those OSPF timers, right? If I don't receive three consecutive hellos or keep alives from GRE and they come in every 30 seconds after 90 seconds, I'm going to take this interface down so that we don't black hole traffic. Let's say do show IP, whoops, do show IP interface brief. You'll see the tunnel interface here, right? Along with these virtual access interfaces that are getting created for us. And there's my tunnel and you can see it shows. And so this is the thing, right? You can see that it shows up, up. 
But we haven't configured anything on the other side yet, right? So we probably want to do that. So let's go not to the ISP. Remember, we're going through the ISP, but we're creating this virtual tunnel interface with the branch. Consider it our branch, right? This is our branch office. So we're doing PPPoE, broadband PPPoE, right, with the provider, but we've also got this serial connection with the provider as well. And so it's over the serial connection that we're going to run this um, GRE tunnel. So again, interface tunnel 100. Now, do the tunnel numbers have to match on both sides? Absolutely not. They don't have to match. But let me tell you from a lot of experience, match them, right? If you can match them, match them. Always, always, always make sure they match. It makes the troubleshooting so much easier. Okay, so we've got the tunnel interface configured here, and I'm looking at the diagram to make sure that I'm spot on. All right, so same thing uh, that we did for the other side, right? So IP address uh, is going to be 192.168.2.2 on this side, 255, 255. And we could have done, again, we could have done a slash 30, but they've got a slash 24 going in here. I'll type this in, tunnel mode GRE IP, not grep. Tunnel mode GRE IP, not required because that's the default, but good practice, good habit to get into. Uh, and then we've got our tunnel source is going to be serial 00, and wait a second, this interface is, yeah, I thought so, serial 001, right, is the interface we were using. And then tunnel destination is the outside IP address on router 1, which is 209.165. Dot 200 dot 81. That same, uh, so it's actually right up here. I'm like looking, squinting down on this piece of paper. It's right here, right? That same IP that we proved we had reachability to, right? We can see our tunnel state changed to up. Let's throw some keep alives in here. 33, right? So three consecutive misses after 90 seconds, which would 30 second hello period, basically. We're going to take that interface down. Show run interface tunnel 100. And there it is. So let's say do show IP. Oops, IP interface brief. And we can see there's tunnel 100. We show that we're up, up. Well, now the, the big test. Let's ping. Can we ping the other side? 192.168.2.1. And remember, I'm directly connected. And take a look here. Right? So we're going out over the internet, and we have no connectivity. So why is there no connectivity? So we're going to have to troubleshoot this because the serial, I'm sorry, the tunnel interface is saying that it's up, but there's no connectivity. So do show run interface tunnel 100. And you know what? There's a BGP config section that I was holding off on. And I'm wondering, let me double check this here. Nope, that is over PPPOE. So what I'm looking at is I'm checking to make sure, because I, I didn't cut and paste the configs in. I put it in by hand. Let me make sure I got everything in here. The loop back. And the static route. Let me make sure that that default route, because there was a... Or wait a second, did I just not wait long enough? Let's say do ping 192.168.2.2. Okay, yeah, I, you know, faking myself out here, double checking, thinking I had made a mistake, and it looks like I just simply didn't wait long enough, right? So there we go. So I was anticipating it was going to come up a lot quicker than that. It didn't. I was worried that I had left some config out. So we've got the GRE. So take a look at that. The GRE tunnel is now working. Right, so we're up. It says, how can you tell if the tunnel was created successfully? Well, we just pinged across the tunnel, and so everything looks good. So now it says, what would happen if customer one did not have a static default route? So test it by removing the static default route. What was the result? And so let's come back over to customer one, and let's exit out here, do show run, and pipe it to include route. And let's say no. IP route, and we'll pull this out, copy and paste. OK, so we're going to pull that out. So now let's say do show IP interface brief. And let's see what our tunnel shows. 
So the tunnel still shows up, up. Let me ping 192.168.2.2. And let's go ahead and type repeat. And we'll put a bunch of pings in here. And let's see how long that goes for. Now, when we pull it out, right, we're actually going to be asked to place it back in. And let's actually make sure, before we do that, let me say Control Shift 6, do show IP route, IP route. Let's make sure that it's not in there. Yeah, so you can clearly see that it's not in there. But the tunnel is dependent upon that connection, right? So here is the routing entry for the tunnel. Right, you can, or I should say, the route table entry that shows to get over to the 192.168.2.0/24 that we're going to take tunnel 100. But remember, and there we go, and it just just in time. So now, when I go to ping, take a look. Yeah, the tunnel interface is definitely down, right? So the pings aren't going to work because I've removed the static route that gave me my ability to reach the tunnel destination. That statement inside the tunnel interface, do show interface tunnel 100, and that's not what I was looking for, do show run interface tunnel 100. That destination, that tunnel destination statement right here, I can't get there anymore once I remove that static route. I'm going to lose my ability to reach the tunnel interface. So again, they want us to drop that statement back in. So let's go ahead and put the default route back in. We'll say Control A and then save ourselves some backspacing. So now that it's back in, what we should see, and I'll kick the ping off here, is not immediately, right? You can see the default route is in here, but we've got to let GRE work its magic. And the tunnel interface, the line protocol came up. And then it dropped down, but we should be back here shortly. We'll give it a second or two. And now we're going to be transitioning. Once the tunnel is up, we're now going to be configuring eBGP over PPPoE and BGP over the GRE tunnel. So we've got all kinds of stuff that's going to be taking place here. And as you can see, we are now back up and ready to rock. So let's say Control Shift 6. And in part four, let me show you. This is BG. Okay, so configure BGP on customer one and branch one. The ISP router is already complete. So it's actually not because I was thinking they were going to ask us to put that in. So we'll tackle this all together. So let's do the BGP over PPPoE first. So let me flip over here and make sure that they're asking... So on customer one, yeah, all right. So here we go. So on customer one, how do we configure eBGP? Super, super simple, right? Very straightforward from the most basic perspective. So router BGP and then our autonomous system number. Remember that we are AS65000. That's a private AS number. So there we go. Now we need a neighbor statement, right? And we're going to be doing it with the address that we know over that PPPoE tunnel. So it's going to be neighbor 209 209.165. And what is that PPPoE address pool that we used? Let me come back over here. Give me one second here. Show IP, interface brief. I think it was dot 30. Is that right? Yeah, 209, 209.165.200.30. So 209.165.200.30, and then I put down their remote autonomous system, keeping in mind that this is how BGP is going to determine whether or not this is an eBGP or an iBGP connection. Remember, it would be iBGP if they were the same. If the autonomous system numbers are the same, that is an iBGP pairing. If the autonomous system numbers are different, it is an E BGP pairing, right? So the AS, and let me look at the diagram, is 65001, right? And it wants me to advertise on customer one the networks attached to loopback one and gig zero zero. Okay, so here's where we come to the point that we're, they simply want us to do this network. And this is the only purpose of this gig zero zero interface. This could have been loop back two, just as easily could have been loop back two. That's the only reason they've got us plugging into the switch here. 
and it is 192.168.1.0. Remember, I'm putting the network in, followed by the subnet mask and dotted decimal notation. And then we're going to say loopback1, which is, and they give us this bizarre address here, 209.165.200.0. Dot, and the IP, boy, oh boy, I see what they, okay, I know what they're doing here. They're giving us a little extra exercise, right, and giving us an opportunity to do some subnetting. So this is a dot .240, it's a slash 28, and the IP is actually, so let's put the IP up here, 209.165. Dot, and this is the tricky one. Again, the 192.168.1, it's a slash 24. That's a given at this point in the course, right? We know that that's 255, 255, 255.0, and we know that it's going to be dot zero here because it's the whole slash 24. But with this, 209.165.200.49. So what's the network ID for the usable IP dot 49? Well, we know a super easy way to figure this out. All we need to get is the block size, right? So if the dotted decimal is a dot .240, right? And let's say that this is the last octet that we're borrowing host bits from, turning them into network bits. If it's a 240, we know it's 128, 192, 224, 240. And the reason I say slash 28 is remember, the first 24 bits going this way are all network bits already. We're borrowing so that we can right size and subnet here. So two to the four is also two times two times two times two. That is 16. So my block size is 16. So if I started at the first network ID of dot zero, I would go to dot 16 and then dot 32 and then dot 48, and I can halt right there, but we'll put one more in over here, 64, is that right? Yeah, 64. So I can see that what subnet is this gonna fall into? Because if you were to put the IP address in there and then put the subnet mask in and say 255, 255, 255, dot 240, not going to work, not going to work. It has to be an exact match. And so we know that this subnet here, right, that dot 49 falls in here. So what's the network ID? You've got it, dot 48. So let's clear the screen. Let's get back over here before it logs me out. So my network ID is that, and then it gave me, right, 240, the network mask. Now, here's how you check this, right? We're going to go over when we configure BGP on the... Um, on the provider side, this is where we're going to be able to make that check, right? We're going to be able to say show IP BGP, and we should see these two networks being advertised from Autonomous System 65001. So now that I've done the customer setup here, let's go ahead and do the provider side, which I kind of held off on so we could you know, get a little extra BGP work in here. So again, router, BGP, 65001. Who's my neighbor? It's going to be 209-165-200.0. Uh, and give me a second here. I want to make sure we're getting this right. Yeah, the remote autonomous system is 65,000. All right, am I advertised? Let's see if they've got any... Yeah, so they're actually having you configure a network of quad zeros. And take a look. We just did, so not only did we just do PPPoE over a simulated, you know, broadband access connection, right, to the provider, we are now running BGP over PPoE, which is PPP over Ethernet, right? Very, very cool stuff, right? This is a killer lab, fantastic lab. So here I am on the provider. Let's punch out of there. Show IP BGP. Bingo. Take a look at that. You got to love it. So here are some of the fields that we're looking for. We're making sure that it is valid and that it is the best. And this is the BGP rib. If I wanted to see the global rib, you say show IP route, right? And, 
Oh, and this is a good question here. I think we've got a good question coming up here. Is it going to do it? No, it, okay, we're both in here. Is, is BGP. So here it is. So I'm, again, I'm advertising this via BGP, right? And remember, that is that loopback address down on router one. And this is the gig interface, which could have and should have probably just been a loopback address, but they had us plug it into the switch anyway. And this is the only thing we're using this for. And when we get over to the branch router, it's the same thing. That that Ethernet interface, the only reason it's plugged into a switch is so that it's it, it comes up so that we can advertise it out. And take a look at that. We've got our BGP information, right? Let's go to the customer side. So here on the customer side, let's say show IP BGP. Whoops, show IP BGP. And we can see that that is what we are advertising, right? You see that because in the next hop is the dead giveaway. When we've got the quad zeros, that means that we're advertising that. What if I say show IP route now? Right? Take a look. So there's our route. And again, why did they have us put that? I'm wondering why on the provider we put the network quad zeros in there because we've got default routes to find. Let me, they may have us pull these out. Maybe they have them pull us out. We'll see what happens. Okay, so the BGP is up and running. So we've got BGP over PPP over Ethernet. So PPP OE, pretty cool. Now let's hit the branch up. So we're gonna come over here to router three, branch one, router three, and let's go from user exec to privilege exec, whoops, into global config, and create the BGP routing process. So router BGP, and what's the AS of the branch? 65010, or 65010. Who's my neighbor? And we're doing this over the, or wait a second, are we doing this over the GRE tunnel? Uh, advertise the network attachment. I apologize, before we do the branch, I think I got ahead of myself to the ISPM branch router. So we got to come back. Let's go back to the customer one. We'll start on the customer one side since we're, we've already got this configured here. So let's do this. So let's get into, sorry, router BGP 65,000 and do show run section router BGP. So we only have the neighbor statement for the ISP. Now let's do BGP over GRE, right? So let's go ahead and say neighbor 192, and again, these are the tunnel interfaces we're using, 168.2.2, and the remote AS is 65010. Uh, and that is all we need there, right? That's going to be all we need. So I'm going to save it. We're going to write it out just to be sure. And so here we are on the, we'll call it our customer headquarters router. Now let's come over to the branch router. So we're in the BGP config. So my neighbor is who? It's that directly connected 192.168.2.1 remote AS 65,000. Now we're also going to be advertising out the network attached to gig 01. Again, the only reason on router three that they had us plug that cable into switch three was so that we could advertise this network out. And again, could have done it with a loopback address. So I'm gonna hit enter. And what are we going to see? And hopefully, and BGP is much slower than the IGPs. So we'll give it a and take a look at that. So absolutely beautiful. So now, do show IP BGP. Take a look. And I'm learning BGP routing information from router one, right? That's information being advertised from router one that, uh, I should say router one, customer one, which is router one, that is being learned by the branch, branch one, which is router three. But now let's put our network statement in here for the 192.168.3.0. Remember, it's got to be the network identifier, not the IP. And it's a slash 24. So let's come over here to the customer. And let's see, show IP BGP. I should have some additional information, and I do. Check that out, right? And we're learning it from 65, the autonomous system path, the AS path, right? So it's coming from or through 65010. That's where it originated. And uh, let's say show IP route BGP. So how would I get there? Right, so the BGP routing table says to get to the 192.168.3.0, we're gonna go via 2.2. If I say show IP route, 
we know that to get to the 2.2, .2, I'm going to go out the tunnel interface. So from router 1, can I ping 192.168.3, whoops, dot three dot one? Absolutely. What if I trace over there? 192.168.3.1. And I should have actually done, let's do numeric to make it a little quicker. And you can see the hop goes right through the tunnel. All right, so we had some questions here. And it said, on customer one, did you receive a console message regarding the neighborship? Yep, absolutely we did. On customer one, can we ping the ISP? So let's see if we can ping the ISP at 209.165.200.30 over PPPoE. Can you ping, ping the branch local network? Well, we could do that, and we can certainly ping that 200.30 address. Check the routing table on customer one, what routes were learned by BGP. And we saw that show IP route BGP. Right, it's that three dot. And it says there should be a route learned from both ISP and branch one. And the reason, I'm wondering if it's that quad network statement that they were expecting. Because they've got this network quad zero statement, and but I don't see them asking us to remove the static route off of off of router one. And let's, or I should say, off of the. Let me do this real quick. I'm curious to see something here because it looks like they're trying to send a default route down here, and do show run include route. So I'm going to say no. And let's pull this out, copy and paste. And do clear IP BGP star in. And this is basically, I'm just refreshing. I'm asking BGP to, to refresh in a non-disruptive fashion uh, to basically query any neighbors and say, hey, you know, here's what I've got. And do you have anything that's new for me? Do show IP route. Yeah, and it's not that's not actually how you advertise the default route. So that's interesting. I'm curious as to why they had that in there. So anyway, we'll put the default in there before the tunnel crashes. Uh, examine the two routes learned by BGP in the customer one routing table. What do they show about the routes in the network now? So do show IP. And we are not picking anything up from the ISP. Did I, give me a second here. So BGP is only with customer one off router three. So it's got to be that, I, I'm wondering if they were expecting the default route. So let me go over to the provider here and let's do this. You can see show run section router BGP that they have that, and this is in the config. They had us type that in. Uh, and it looks like they want us to originate a default route. But that's not how you originate the default route. I'm wondering why the instructions are showing that. Let me do this instead. Maybe this is a typo, router BGP, BGP 65001. Because again, we have a static, oh, you know what? Did I not configure it? Do show IP route. Did I not configure that? Ugh, epic failure. All right. Fortuitous failure, though. So in the config instructions, there is a static default route that points to the loopback interface that I thought I had configured. Do show run include route. I didn't. So I thought they were trying to originate a default route. There's a, you can do it. There's a different way to do it, right? But if you have a static, and let me go ahead and get this sorted out correctly here. And I apologize because this is not good form. Uh, let's get out of the router config section and let's run that again. And I think it's going to be... Let me make sure. Did I not configure the loopback interface? Hold on one second here. Do show IP interface brief. Okay, so there's the loopback one interface. So IP route quad zero, zero dot zero zero zero, zero dot zero dot zero dot zero, 
loop back one. Okay, so now we should be set. So I'll say do clear IP BGP star out. And now let's come over. And so now it's making sense because when I was looking at that, I'm like, okay, so that should we should get the default. And I'm like, but no, it's not default originate. So there's some syntax that you can use under BGP that's different than that syntax to originate a default route. So do show IP BGP. Do show IP BGP. And that is what I was looking for. So there's the default route. So now when I say do show IP route, and this is a very important conversation to have. So when I say do show IP route, when we look here, what happened to my static? Why is the static gone and the BGP route being installed in the routing table? Remember when we configured the static route here? And this question got asked. I think David asked this question. I know Andrew asked this question. When we put the command on the customer router, which we're on right now, we said IP route quad zero, quad zero, and we threw the serial interface in there. But then there was this 25 at the end. And this is exactly why they put that 25 at the end of this activity is so that it would be less attractive, less reliable than that administrative distance that we learned that we picked up here, right, from BGP. Because look here, if I scoot back up just a little bit where we did a show IP route before I removed it and went into a tailspin, right, you can see we had this static. And when we configured that static, we said IP route 0000000000. 000 000 000 000 000 000 000 000. We put the interface in there. And then I put the administrative distance. I set it to 25. So watch what happens if I set it to 19. Because look at the administrative distance of eBGP. So let's set it to 19 and see what happens. Show IP route. Yeah, where's my BGP learned default route? It is gone. And this is, this is pretty cool. So we're going to say show IP. So that's the global routing table. So did I learn the route? Yeah, I learned it, right? It's here. It's in the BGP table. So BGP got it. But what's this R? right? Kind of funny looking. And it says rib failure. So BGP learned it via BGP. It installed it into the BGP routing table, but it failed to install it into the global rib. Well, that's interesting. I wonder why. Well, there happens to be a command for that. And if I can remember it, so, and in fact, I usually use the show BGP IPv4 unicast, and it is rib failure. So that's the command right there that will show you why BGP was unable to get this BGP learned route into the global routing table. And that's why. The rib failure, why? Because this BGP learn default route is less attractive, less reliable than the one that's already in the rib because it's got a higher administrative distance than the one that we configured locally. So again, that is why they had to set it, whoops, to 25. So if I do that and then say show IP route, take a look at that. It's the BGP learn route. So now we do see show IP uh, route BGP. So now we do see two routes that were learned. We see the, the route from the branch and we see the route from the service provider. Man, let me just say, th this is a phenomenal activity. Deals with a lot of real world stuff here. And I'm just kind of flipping to make sure we got everything covered. And so that is it. Uh, so I promised you guys I would do this one up as a lab with additional explanation as to what it was we were doing, why we were doing it and what some of the trickier parts of this lab were all about. All right, well, this takes care of the in-class lab
The in-class Netacad lab 3.6.1.3, right, a little supplemental activity here, where we did PPPoE, GRE, and then ran EBGP peerings over both of those guys. Awesome, awesome stuff. And we even talked a little bit about administrative distance and why you would see a rib failure in the BGP routing table, right? Not the global routing table, but the BGP routing table. All right, guys, happy Friday. Stay warm out there. It's going to be very cold this weekend. I will see you all on Tuesday night.